about to uh, begin this study on prayer, and I think this is one of the most uh, basic, it's a simple course, but it's one of the most profound courses that we can offer our students. And so I know you may be tempted to say, oh man, you know, I know about prayer and I pray, but I want you to uh, just pray and ask God to take you to a new life. Uh, to a new place, to a new uh, way of living concerning the aspect of prayer. And I'm going to ask the Lord myself to bless this course and to use it. No matter how spiritual you may be in your prayer life, no matter how much you may pray, uh, I pray that God is going to, um, he's, just going to he's just going to show you some things you haven't seen. And that you're going to reach some places that you've never reached in the Lord and it's going to impact everything concerning your life and your ministry, your family, your marriage, whatever uh, is important to you is going to be impacted by prayer. So we're about to get into this course as we do. Go ahead and turn to lesson one and uh, uh, the title of this is The Importance of Prayer. In lesson one I want you to bear with me. Uh, it's pretty much an introductory lesson and then we'll get more into it as we go into the, the uh, next lessons. So for this one, um, we're going to start out by just reading some of the thoughts that have been expressed by great leaders uh, in the past and even to the, um, to the current times concerning prayer and how it has affected them and their lives. So um, let's look at, just, just read a few of these. Here's some of the things that have been said about prayer. John Wesley said, God does nothing on earth save in answer to believing prayer. Um, Billy Graham said this, he said, we're living in dangerous times, and if there was ever a time when we need to pray, it is now. More can be done by prayer than anything else. Prayer is our greatest weapon, he says. Jack Hayford, prayer is invading the impossible. It is essentially a partnership of the redeemed child of God working hand in hand with God toward the realization of his redemptive purpose on earth. Charles H. Spurgeon said, If I could impress my heart on every syllable and baptize every word with my tears, I could not too earnestly entreat you to be above all things earnest in prayer. Uh, understand with me that these are people who have proven lives of successful ministry and effectiveness in untold measures. Um, and probably you are like me. I would love to to be able to learn from them and to grow so that we might reach some of the heights for the glory of God that they reached. And these individuals are saying the key, the secret to what God did in their lifetime or is doing was directly related to the development, consistency, and effectiveness of their prayer life. Uh, listen to this by R.A. Torrey. He says, Your growth and mine into the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be in exact proportion to the time and to the heart we put into prayer. So, uh, don't tell me how spiritual you are. Show me by your prayer life. Amen. Um, here's another good one. Just jumping over a couple that are good, but I just we just don't want to read them all. You'll read them as you go through your study guide. Oswald Chambers says, Prayer does not fit us for the greater works. It is the greater work. Wow. So all those performances and all those great sermons we preached and all those uh, moving altar calls that we have given, so important, so effective for bringing people into the kingdom of God, feeding people, encouraging people, strengthening people. But yet he's saying that he found and he discovered that prayer was even greater. Man, Martin Luther, I'm so busy now that if I did not spend two or three hours each day in prayer, I would not get through the day. I like his way of thinking. Amen. Abraham Lincoln says, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. My own wisdom. And all and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. So they can say prayer was the only place he could go to find the answers and the solution 
that he needed in his time of decision making. That's powerful, amen. I know that you understand because you're in the ministry probably already, to, at least to some degree, if not full time and full, full force ahead. Uh, I know you understand. Ministry is only a few hours a week about standing, preaching, teaching. The majority of ministry is done all day long, sometimes in the middle of the night, all week long, and it's meeting person to person, face to face, people who are in time of need and people who need the Lord. Amen. And so ministry is very, very taxing and it's very, very um, heavy at times. And the man of God says he wouldn't even dare try to approach a day that was going to be busy without, he said, two or three hours of prayer. I think that's powerful. Amen. Uh, here's a good one. The old prophet Isaiah said in 56, 7, he said, For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Uh, and then, of course, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Luke 18, 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not lose heart. You can look at that and interpret it probably many ways, but a couple here would be, Men ought, ought always to pray and not lose heart. In other words, not give up on their prayer, prayer life. You could also look at it and you could see it this way. Men are always to pray and not lose heart. Men that pray don't lose heart. Amen. So um, we can meditate on these quotes. Uh, I believe that the majority of them, if not all of them, were very inspired of the Holy Spirit when these men of God or women of God spoke them. And they're worthy of our contemplation and uh, consideration. Amen. Um, in your outline, you see that we have a definition of prayer and it's somewhat lengthy uh, and then we define prayerlessness and so um, I'm just going to just hit on one or two but you're going to be reading the list and uh, considering all of those things so so number one your prayer is trusting God um, prayer is an agreement with others that God is able I always like to say and I've said this many times and kind of goes along with this uh, the reason some Christians don't pray is because they don't really believe God answers prayer. I know they'd argue that point. They'd get mad at me probably for saying that. I dare you say that. I believe God answers prayer. But if we really believed God answered prayer, we pray all the time. Just think about it. I like this one here. It's kind of simple, but it kind of communicates relationship. It says prayer is a tiny hand placed in a great hand. Amen. Kind of kind of relating the idea that when my hand goes into the hand of the great one God who reigns over the universe, amen, that I'm in relationship with him to do his will, his purpose, and that his hand is holding on to my hand, that he pulls me through, he pulls me over, he pulls me up, and he pulls me home. Amen? Amen. Uh, prayerlessness defined. Prayerlessness is saying, I'm too busy for God. Prayerlessness is walking in the dark blindfolded. Prayerlessness is the fool saying in his heart, there is no God. It's wasting time you think you're saving. It's seeing only with the natural eyes. It's presuming upon God's grace and mercy. It's a car with no petrol. It's trusting in your own strength. It's the pride of life. It's counting on someone else to do the praying. And that's a pretty serious expectation. <laughs> Amen. Uh, prayerlessness is going into battle without armor or weapons. It's laziness. And it's giving into self. Uh, appreciate David Newquest for these thoughts. And uh, I believe that, again, we should pause and just think about some of these thoughts that are communicated about prayer. Uh, in our outline, number two says, God promises to respond to the prayers of his people. I want us to specifically notice the key verses in the Bible that are relative to prayer. Let's just look at a couple of these here, if, if not more. Uh, we probably all know 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. I know when I was uh, in Bible college, down in uh, Waxahachie, Texas in 1978 in the fall, I preached my first sermon at the age of 19, and I preached from this text right here, 2 Chronicles 
14. And of course, I think the entire sermon was 10 minutes long. <laughs> I was terrified. But you know, God used it, and we saw people respond, and uh, it was powerful. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Psalms 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to the cry. You don't cry, God can't hear you. Psalms 91, 14 through 16, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalms 145, 18, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Psalms 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. S Isaiah 65, 24, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all your heart, wow, Jeremiah 33, 2-3, again familiar. Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's a promise, amen. How about Matthew 7, 7-11? This is uh, Jesus speaking. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? That's powerful, amen. Jesus is declaring to us how to pray and how to act upon our prayer and it with expectation and faith amen and what to expect from the character of god when we pray to god amen here's another one mark 11 24 therefore i say unto you whatsoever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them that's a promise what about john 14 12 through 14 most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me the works that i do he will do also and greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name. John fifteen seven. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Uh, let's jump down here to James fifteen sixteen. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The word avails means force. The effective, fervent prayer, the hot prayer, the intense prayer, the sincere prayer, let me add that, forces much. We're talking about spiritual impact, amen, because of prayer. And let's read this last one here. Uh, this is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. Amen. So there is a confidence and an assurance that I've been with Jesus. And because I've been with Jesus, I expect things are going to change. Things are about to happen, amen, because uh, I've met with him and he has assured me that he has heard me, amen. So Jesus gives us an example of prayer and dependence on the Father. Um, he's, uh, he often withdrew with, from multitudes to spend time along with prayer. I always like to point out here that uh, we have this tendency to want to run to where the crowds are and Jesus ran to where the Father was. 
Literally, we see him in the Gospels leaving multitudes who came to him, and suddenly he says, let us go and withdraw. And he goes to a place of prayer. Uh, he saw that it was more important than to pray than it was sometimes to stand before the, uh, the large crowd. And so we, brought, we may need to rethink some things, amen? Amen. Luke 5, 15 through 16 explains, However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus responded to the response to his ministry with prayer. Amen. Uh, he liked to pray early in the morning. Mark 1.35, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed in a solitary place, and there he prayed. Amen. So at times, Jesus would spend all night in prayer, especially when he had these important decisions to make concerning life and ministry. Uh, Luke 6, 12 through 13 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. His prayer life aroused the desire for prayer among the disciples. He could, uh, we could actually say that our personal prayer life is stirring others to pray. Uh, particularly if you are a minister of the gospel, if you are a leader in the kingdom of God, people do what they see, not what we tell them to do all the time. Luke 11, 1 um, is, is powerful and depicts this very clearly. It says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Uh, most people understand prayer is not difficult. It's just communication. It's talking to God, but it's also listening to God. It's also spending time in His presence and receiving direction and guidance from God. And so there's just enough to prayer that we, we need to embrace teaching on prayer. Amen. He included uh, others in key times of prayer in Luke 9, 28-29. And now it came to pass, about eight days after these sayings, that he took Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> so we see a lot of things happening here. He prayed on key occasions. He prayed in context of his own baptism in Luke 3, 21, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Prior to his leaving the earth, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays on the cross. And so we see that Jesus did not approach um, major events in his life or ministry or concerning the world or the future. He didn't approach these things uh, half-heartedly or half-prepared. He spent his time with God. He spent his time in prayer. Actually, his entire earthly walk, that is, the days of his flesh, were marked by prayer, Hebrews 5, 7 through 8 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was, excuse me, was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Uh, what we see here is that Jesus did not pray quietly. Jesus prayed with cries and tears, amen. It says with vehement cries. Uh, <laughs> so these are passionate prayers, amen. These are vocal, verbal prayers. They are powerful prayers. And because they were, it empowered him not only to work the miracles that he worked through his hands and in his life, it empowered him to suffer the things that he suffered. Don't ever think that all suffering is... Um, uh, just something to be avoided. The scripture teaches us that we are called to suffer. I hate to tell you that, but that's part of your calling. If you're going to serve God, you're going to experience persecution. You're going to experience a devil who does not like you. But you don't get to give up. Amen. You don't get to whine about it. You don't get to, uh, you know, try to uh, map a, a trip around it. No, you hit it head on in the power of the Spirit. Oh, how do I do that? You pray and you read the word, amen, and you stand firmly in faith, amen. Praise God. So uh, prayer is a vital part of 
the early church and its success, the apostles in the book of Acts demonstrated an absolute dependence on God, which is evidenced by their continual watchfulness and prayer. Uh, somebody said that you can measure your dependence on God by the amount of time you spend in prayer. I think that's good. The early church continued steadfastly in prayer according to Acts 42. Of course, they also partook of communion and fellowship and breaking of bread. Amen. Um, and uh, uh, so that's and doctrine. And so that's powerful. Amen. So to continue steadfastly, let's talk about this. It means to persevere, to give constant attention to a thing. It means to adhere to. Uh, to be devoted to, not to faint, to show oneself courageous, and to be constant, readiness for, and to wait on continuous. So, so what we're talking about here is continuing uh, in all these things, but we're specifically targeting prayer in this lesson, uh, means that uh, you're determined, amen, and you're devoted to it, and, and you're going to be courageous about it, and you're not going to let other things determine your schedule when it's prayer time. Um, you're not going to feel... Uh, your arsenal with other things that are of this realm and this nature, but you're rather going to fill your arsenal with the things of the Spirit. How do I do that? You connect with the Spirit in prayer to the Father. Amen. So the apostles knew that uh, they had responsibility before God to fulfill their primary call to give themselves in prayer. D did you hear that? You and I, our primary call is the call to prayer. Acts 6, 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You say, oh, but, 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 but Dr. Lee, I, I'm called to evangelize the world. Or you say, I'm called to be a great apostle. And an apostle is a powerful man of God. Now, God's going to use me to do many things. Yes, I totally agree. And he's going to use you to develop a prayer line that will be greater than any other aspect of your great ministry. And if you're an apostle, you will understand that. If you're an apostle, you would begin to desire that because you desire that level of relationship and that level of outflow and ministry with the Lord. Amen. Um, we know from the scripture that they prayed on a regular basis. They prayed in specific situations, just like Jesus did, Acts 1, 2, 4, uh, 24, in selecting leadership. They prayed, Acts 6, 6, in setting in leaders, Acts 13, 3, in sending out ministries. Acts 14, 23, and ordaining elders. Acts 20, 26, and 21, 15, in departing from friends. So basically, they started off in prayer, they continued in prayer, and they ended in prayer. Amen. You say, in what situations? All of them. Amen. They prayed for special requests and needs. Uh, they prayed for boldness. They prayed for in the Holy Ghost yet? They prayed to raise the dead. Uh, have you raised anyone from the dead? You're going to need to pray to do that. Amen. Uh, Peter's release. They prayed over that situation and God granted it. They prayed to have the mind of the Lord. Uh, they prayed when deliverance was needed. And they prayed for healing. And God granted it. Amen. So we see that it's not just one example, but there are many examples of this. Acts 4, 23-31. Let's read this whole passage. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God and with one accord said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? And the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you oh, I'm sorry, whom, whom you anointed, excuse me, lost my track there. Uh, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Wow. Throughout that whole situation, we see how it, the whole thing pivoted on prayer. Amen. And I want to tell you, your life, your relationships, your ministry, everything about you 
pivots on prayer. Amen. So in the church, uh, the church in the New Testament was born in prayer. We see that in Acts 1, 14 again. Uh, for then on, prayer was a vital key. The Christians in the books of Acts, the book of Acts breathed the atmosphere of prayer. They believed in the power of prayer. Uh, they began and continued and ended all their work with prayer. At least 17 out of the 28 chapters in the book of Acts have a reference to prayer. It is the link of the saints with the Lord of heaven. Prayer was the channel of the supply of the Spirit. The book of Acts is just that. It is the Acts of the Apostles. Some people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. But in any of those cases, the initiation or the uh, instigation of those great works of the Apostles and or the Holy Spirit were directly connected to prayer amen so if we want a similar type of success to that of Jesus and the early church then we're going to have to be people of prayer and follow the instructions of Hosea who says in 10 12 break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you see prayer has to start at home it has to start in praying for myself in light of uh, my relationship to God in light of uh, my growth and development. I have to pray that God would give me strength over the flesh, that God would give me uh, ability to stay on course with Him and finish my race, amen, and I could go on and on, but let's talk about this scripture right now. Uh, break up your fallow ground, it says, uh, and this is where a lot of us are. This is why we don't have the prayer life we should. Uh, the word break up means that we must take personal responsibility for making a change in our present situation. Uh, I, I love, you know, uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, Rod Parsley called his program Breakthrough. I don't know if he still does or not. But uh, I love the, the, the idea of breakthrough. But uh, unfortunately, much of the body of Christ have somehow jumped on this bandwagon that breakthrough is all about God. And if you get a breakthrough, it's because God, uh, you know, God supernaturally came in and, and he, he gave you a breakthrough and, and thank God I got a breakthrough. Well, no doubt about it. It is supernatural and it is God who does it. However, breakthrough is not referring specifically to what God is going to do. Breakthrough is what, what are you going to do? Amen. If you want a breakthrough, if you want heaven to flood your life, then you're going to have to do the breaking. You're going to have to be the one who changes. You're going to be, have to be the one who chooses. All right? So this is really important. We must take personal responsibility for making a change in our present situation. You want God in your finances. You want God in your ministry. You want God in your marriage. Then do something, but do it in accordance to what the Word says. And God will see that you get your breakthrough, amen. He's that good, amen. Uh, what are you breaking through to or what are you getting beyond? It's the fallow ground. We have to deal with the issues in our own hard hearts and the other hindrances to prayer. Uh, is there ground that is untilled in our lives? Is the ground of our heart filled with weeds? Look at it this way. No matter what you think your most pressing need is right now, no matter what compels you to pray, I ask you to move it into second place and put prayer first. If you will see prayer as the most important thing in your life, then those other issues that present themselves, be they finances, ministry growth, your spiritual development, maturity, if you will see that prayer is the most critical thing, you need effective, disciplined prayer in your life. Those other things will begin to fall in place and become a natural outflow from your prayer life as God meets your needs, amen. Uh, breaking this verse up, continuing with that, for it is time. There's no better time than now. Uh, the reason I believe you chose to enroll in integrity, the reason I believe you ended up with this course is because God wants your prayer life to be better. Don't start comparing yourself with other people. Wherever you are in the Lord, you can improve in your prayer life. And there's no better time to seek the Lord than right now. Amen. 
And what is seeking the Lord? To seek the Lord. Our primary goal in prayer is not to seek things, but to seek the Lord and develop our relationship with Him. Amen? All right? Until. Well, we're to be persistent in prayer, continuing until we see the result of those prayers. Do we just quit right there? No. We already have begun praying for other things as God directs us and leads us. I challenge you to let God work in your prayer life. Allow Him to even stipulate the priorities of need in your life. Let the Holy Spirit discern and determine what you need most. And then you pray about that instead of what your flesh longs for. Well, how do I get in that position? You start out by, number one, prioritizing prayer. And as you prioritize your prayer life, and as you work toward that, and ask God to help you in your prayer life, then the Holy Spirit, as you pray, will begin to bring up those things, those matters that need to be dealt with in prayer, that you need to send be or set before God in petition. Amen. Uh, and you can make those supplication uh, as you're led of the Holy Spirit and the Lord. Amen. And then finally, He comes and He reigns righteousness. Prayer is always led to the fruit of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing about prayer. Prayer is going to take you where you need to be, not where you necessarily want to be. And that's the goal of serving Christ. 